triangle, or whatever the shape happens to be, because perceptually similar items group together and pop out. Now, another way to show automaticity is through what's called masking. Now, normally, you can still make out a, a number if I flash it to your peripheral vision. But if I then surround it with other numbers and crowd it, it becomes invisible. That's called masking. Remarkably, in synesthetes, it still evokes the color, even though they can't consciously make out what the number is. Rather, they deduce, well, it must be a seven because I'm seeing a patch of green. And this tells us that synesthesia occurs very early in perception, perhaps before you're even consciously aware of seeing a stimulus at all. So second, synesthesia is spatially extended. That is, they, they, they speak of going to or looking at a certain location to attend to what it is they see. Sometimes the spatial extension is literally outside the body. Michael Watson often spoke of reaching out at arm's length to palpate the taste that he felt. Whereas another woman with colored hearing speaks of a little screen about six inches in front of her eyes in which music makes colored lines play out. Third, synesthesia is durable, meaning that it's consistent over time, and it's generic, meaning that what they see is not pictorial and elaborated, but simple and elementary. Fourth, it's, it's highly memorable, which I've already alluded to. And in fact, when you say, well, what good does synesthesia do? Why bother seeing colors? And the answer universally is, well, it helps you remember things. And lastly, it's loaded with affect, usually very pleasurable. Uh, synesthetes absolutely gush over the most trivial tasks, such as remembering a phone number or somebody's name, calling it gorgeous and delightful. Uh, the one woman whose name is Jean hates it. She never calls herself Jean because it's an ugly color. She calls herself Alexandra because A is the most beautiful red she's ever seen, and she just loves calling herself Alexandra. Now, on the other hand, mismatch perception, like seeing a letter printed in the wrong color ink, is like fingernails on a blackboard. So these five features define synesthesia's perceptual reality, along with a 40% likelihood that you'll have, if you've got one type of synesthesia, you'll have a second and third type, and by its strong heritability as an X-linked dominant trait. All right. Now, what's going on in these people's brains? Well, I mentioned the color area, V4. And doesn't it stand to reason that if they are claiming to see color, that V4 ought to activate? And it does. In fact, numerous experiments show cross-activation of brain areas given a stimulus and a synesthetic response. So then the question becomes, well, how might such a cross-activation come about? And here, the newborn helps us out. The fetus makes two million synapses a second. That's a second giving newborns an excess of working connections among brain areas. These are then pruned away to leave the modular organization that we know of in adults. So the so-called neonatal hypothesis says that inheriting a genetic mutation causes insufficient pruning between brain areas that normally would have been eliminated by synaptic competition early in life. So what the gene mutation is doing is conferring hyperconnectivity wherever it's expressed in the brain. So if 40% of individuals have a second or third type, that means that they've got the gene expressed in two or three different areas. But suppose this hyperconnectivity gene were expressed not, ran, not you know, selectively here and there, but diffusely in somebody's brain. Then you get somebody with a generalized hyperconnectivity and the ability to link seemingly disparate things. And that's the definition of metaphor, isn't it? Seeing the similar in the dissimilar. Now, it's long been known that synesthesia is much more common in creative people, such as artists and composers. Some famous synesthetes include Vladimir Nabokov, who had it in three generations of his family, the composers Olivier Messiaen and Amy Beach, and the artist David Hockney, who I've examined and have written about. Now, because they're used to mapping one concept to another in very unconventional ways, it stands to reason that they'd be more creative in other aspects of their lives. They're more open to novel experience. They're less constrained by rules than the rest of us are. Now, Kandinsky, uh, he wrote a great deal to indicate that he had perceptual synesthesia. Listening to Wagner's Lohengrin, he said, I saw all my colors in my mind. They stood before me. 
wild, crazy lines sketched themselves before me. Well, wild, crazy lines could easily describe Kandinsky's own canvases. He had four synesthetic senses. He had color, sound, smell, and touch. He said that, that color had touch and texture, calling orange a prickly color, whereas dark ultramarine was smooth and felt like velvet. Color also had a unique smell. And he said, you know, there's a common expression, the scent of color, which I don't think anybody thinks is common, but it tells you something about what's going on in his mind. <laughs> and lastly, he equated color with unique sounds, which he had elaborated on in his book on the spiritual and art. Later on, he equated color with Schoenberg's 12-tone music. So what Kandinsky did was to gradually intellectualize synesthesia. He made it abstract, and he hoped to find universal correspondences among the senses that would apply to everybody. Except now we know that it doesn't work that way, that synesthetic associations are idiosyncratic. They're unique to every individual. Now, compared to Kandinsky, Clay, if he was synesthetic, and the evidence for him is very meager, so I don't want to overstate the case, Clay stuck to the more immediate and sensuous aspects of his perceptions. He said, color possesses me. I don't have to pursue it. It will possess me always. I know it. He says, one day I must be able to improvise on the keyboard of color, the row of watercolors on my, in my paint box. Now, again, he, he was a violinist. He trained as a musician. And at the Bauhaus, he studied relationships and similarities between auditory and visual rhythms, often using the term polyphonic, meaning many voiced, in his painting titles to convey the sounds that he says he created sounds by layering color line and shape on one another. And to quote him, he said, the simultaneity of distinct themes is not something that's unique to music. Well, if you look at both Kandinsky and Clay's canvases, I think you'll discern in them what neuropsychology calls the form constants, or the possible building blocks of perception. What are these? Well, starting in 1930, the psychologist Heinrich Kluver wanted to understand the experience of visual hallucinations. But he quickly discovered that the subjects were overwhelmed and awed by the indescribableness of what they were seeing, and that they quickly yielded to cosmic interpretations instead of straightforward descriptions of what they were seeing. But once Kluver got them to hone it down to the bare essentials, he discovered four basic kinds of sensory configurations that he called grids, uh, tunnels and cones, grids and cross hatchings, central radiations, and spirals. And, and there are the form constants. And this is why I said that when listening to music, synesthetes don't see a pastoral landscape with sheep gambling through it. They see geometric shapes, zigzags, grids, uh, blobs, uh, angular forms. It's why Michael Watson's tasted shapes were largely geometric. It's why you can see the big spiral configuration in the, the large kupka behind you. And especially you'll see the form constants in the films because they're dynamic. They move and blend into water in, the, in, in a kaleidoscopic kind of melange. What's fascinating is that you've got a scientist coming at it from one point of view asking, what are the essentials of perceptual configuration? And you've got artists coming at it from another direction entirely, and you end up with very similar forms. OK, I talked about synesthesia's perceptual reality and its underlying mechanism of hyperconnectivity, but I haven't yet said the so what, which is that all of us are synesthetic, except the majority of us are unconscious about the sensory fusions going on in our brain all the time. Now, why do I say this? Well. When we use metaphors like loud tie or sweet person, we don't mean that if we lick them like an ice cream cone, they taste sweet. We mean that they're pleasant and agreeable the way that sweets are. Now, a schizophrenic will interpret that metaphor literally, concretely, but the rest of us have no trouble understanding what it means. Why is that? Well, it turns out that for both synesthetes and non-synesthetes alike, there are lawful and regular relationships among the senses. So that, for example, we say that a loud tone is brighter than a soft tone, and that a high tone is smaller than a low tone, and that low tones are both larger and darker than, than high ones. Even smell maps the high, low, and bright, dark dimensions, and the relationship between color